Niagara was always more than a natural wonder. The awesome falls were North America's first great symbol, an emblem for the vast, untamed continent. In time, they would become something quite different, a symbol of how we exploited the land and how we tried to preserve it, how we began to control nature and how we learned to use it. So it is that the story of Niagara Falls is not a straightforward tale, but a story of rises and falls. It is a story of fear and affection, genius and lunacy, virtue and greed, romance and passion. Niagara, in short, describes us. Over and over again, the falls tells all. This program was made possible by the Niagara Parks Commission in Canada, presenting the authentic falls experience to the world since 1885. Home to Niagara Falls, Great Gorge attractions, and War of 1812 historic sites. The Niagara Tourism and Convention Corporation, a nonprofit organization committed to economic development for all of Niagara, USA based on tourism, meetings, conventions, and conferences. Simonelli Real Estate Corporation, providing a wide variety of commercial real estate services in upstate New York, Florida, and southern Ontario. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Niagara is a tale of ongoing sound and fury that begins with miles of quiet. The waters of four great lakes, two-thirds of the fresh water on the entire continent, flow gently along the Niagara River, marking the border between the U.S. and Canada. For 20 miles, a level grade until the mass of water suddenly divides and two immense waterfalls plunge 20 stories down, diving into a roiling pool of water 200 feet deep. This awesome raging cataract has today throughout the world given its name to turbulent waters even by men who've never seen it. In uncounted languages, in deference to its power, a torrent, a flood, anywhere, becomes Niagara. Now everybody has to look on the left-hand side, because this is the view of all views in the world. The um, American Falls, which is flying by, and uh, Goat Island. And, uh, the small falls to the right of the American Falls is called the Bridal Veil. To the extreme left of the Horseshoe Falls is Terrapin Point, through which passes the international borderline between the United States and Canada. Beneath us, the water plunges to a depth of 180 feet, or 55 meters. The water that flows over the falls comes from four of the five Great Lakes. From here, the water goes down the Niagara River to Lake Ontario. The falls of Niagara are in western New York and southern Ontario. There are really three waterfalls. The American Falls and the Narrow Bridal Veil Falls are entirely in the United States. The giant Horseshoe Falls, more than a mile across, stretches between Canada and the U.S. For over 400 years, the falls have been an inspiration for passions and obsessions of all kinds. Many composers have been inspired by water. I was inspired to write a piece about the one of the greatest icons of, of, of American culture because my, my parents 
had their honeymoon here in 1954. My mother made this collar for me in the early 1980s, and she made it for me in specific reference to Niagara Falls. This is my home, my shrine to Niagara, my museum, you might say, of Niagara's past. And here I have before your eyes many of my creations to celebrate Niagara's past. For example, a statistical study I did of the accidents and suicides at Niagara Falls. The natural history of Niagara Falls. I produced a model here that shows how the falls moved seven miles from when they began 12,000 years ago. As it moved and created its gorge, it paralleled human history. The human story at Niagara began long before it was written down. It was home to the Haudenosaunee, the group of Native American tribes eventually known to the Europeans as the Iroquois. For Native people, Niagara Falls is a very powerful place. It's the place where the grandfathers live underneath the falls, great powerful spirit beings that guide us and are very important to us. It's part of our beginning story or our creation story. Over 300 years ago, Native American guides led the first European explorers to Niagara. The Europeans had a peculiar reaction. They were terrified. This was an, a waterfall completely unlike anything that Europeans had e either seen or imagined. So many of the early pictures have little figures right up on the brink who are gesticulating madly. Sometimes they're showing wonder, sometimes they're showing astonishment, sometimes they're cowering. Niagara Falls was terrifying. It's awe-inspiring. It is bigger than anyone can imagine. It was thought to represent God's power in nature. Many people talked about the voice of the falls as God's voice speaking to them. So that it was like God, terrible, terrifying, and yet full of promise, full of hope. In the early years, because Niagara Falls was so distant and so inaccessible, uh, almost nobody could, could get to it and could actually see it. So you could imagine it any way you wanted to. And people did imagine it as fabulous. Niagara's fame spread quickly through dreamlike drawings and unlikely reports. In the early days, only a few Europeans actually saw the falls. It was no easy destination. As late as 1800, a journey from New England took weeks of bone-jarring carriage travel, followed by a hike of many days. Around the falls, wolves and rattlesnakes were plentiful. To get close to the cataracts, a visitor had to climb down by hanging onto scrawny vines, until a local entrepreneur built a spiral staircase down the gorge in 1815. The adventurers could now go exploring behind Horseshoe Falls, as they can today. But modern visitors take the elevator. Good morning and welcome to Journey Behind the Falls. You are now descending 38 meters to 198 meters of man-made tunnels. They consist of two outdoor observation decks and two portholes, one third of the way behind the Canadian Horseshoe Falls. The falls itself is 54 meters high and there's 154 million liters of water going over the falls each minute. up to the first bit of power chords based on Niagara Falls. Here it is. Niagara Falls. The initial appeal of Niagara and its sublime meaning came from the fact that it represented untouched virgin wilderness. 
And of course, as settlement came to this area and moved westward in general, the whole area became built up, it was humanized and in effect tamed. The first visitors were content to simply gaze at the falls. But at the turn of the 19th century, a new idea came to Niagara, a vision of dollars and cents falling in an endless torrent. In the early part of the 19th century, the hotel owners wanted uh, people to stay longer. So they decided to create a distraction, a real, real exciting experience. They advertised in the papers, come and see a ship go over the falls loaded with wild creatures. The hotel's owners sent the Michigan, a derelict merchant vessel decked out as a pirate ship over the falls in September 1827. Aboard ship were 23 animals, including a bear and a buffalo. 20,000 people watched the animals die. The carnival of exploitation had begun. Even in the early days, there was a big debate. Was Niagara Falls a place to come to think about humanity's puny place in the great universe? Or was Niagara Falls a place to have fun? Those two themes in Niagara's history, is this for quiet contemplation of nature or is this an amusement park? They have really characterized Niagara's history for a couple centuries. If we look at Niagara Falls history, it's always a, it grouped in centuries. We had the, the early uh, Native Americans and then we had the French coming in the 17th century and the English in the 18th century. What happened in the 19th century here was railroads. In the 1840s, two great rail lines, Canada's Great Western and the New York Central, chugged into Niagara and stopped on each side of the gorge. The Niagara River forms a watery great wall between Canada and the U.S. Below the falls, the river forms the Whirlpool Rapids, the deep, impassable chasm. For hundreds of miles, there was no way to go from one country to the other without a boat. Then the suspension bridge was invented. A bridge was designed for Niagara, the building set to begin, when a very basic problem became obvious. The very first thing you do when you're building a suspension bridge is get the first line across. They tried a steamship to get the first line across, and that wouldn't work. They tried a bow and arrow, and that wasn't going to work. They tried a cannon. That didn't work. But a kite, the lowest tech they could come up with, saved the day. The kite belonged to a 15-year-old, a local boy named Homan Walsh. In January 1848, he tried to fly his kite across the gorge, only to have it snag on the ice below. Eight days later, he tried again. And there's prevailing wind out of Canada, out of the southwest. This is what Herman Walsh had the day he flew. He went to the Canadian side, flew his line over, and we caught it over here on this side. Just a few meters down uh, the gorge. The next day, heavier line was fed over and heavier cable until it was a wire cable. In March 1855, the Niagara Falls Suspension Bridge opened for business, the first in the world to carry railroad trains. Delighted visitors could now clatter across the gorge, 220 feet above the roaring rapids. Just gazing up at the falls wasn't enough anymore. The new breed of tourists wanted amusement, thrills, and even a few souvenirs along the banks on both sides of the river. A century or so ago, you would have found native women seated selling souvenirs, selling beaded items. We see our ancestors sitting on the blanket at the falls. They brought their wares up here and all their beads, and they sat here and sewed all day long and selling at the same time. I marvel how they made a living. And I always remember the quote we were always told as children, and that was, you know, if you can do beadwork, you won't starve. Coming to Niagara Falls had that kind of exotic quality to it. It was part of something that was called the Grand Tour. And the confirmation of one's journey to Niagara Falls was to purchase uh, a piece of beadwork, and the beadwork would have been labeled from the Tuscar people. 
of people marveled at the sight of what they often called their first Indian just as much. It was produced as magnificent a sensation as seeing the falls themselves. In the 1860s, the 1890s, there was a great lament over the loss of the natural world. The symbol of that loss of innocence, that loss of the wilderness, became the native person. The romantic Indian, the exotic Indian, were played against the backdrop of the falls. We'll be right back with a broadcast of Niagara Falls in just a moment. The sea. <laughs> We have the waterfall itself, which people describe as in, in kind of religious terms or sacred terms. But then all around it, we have a circus. And this circus is not something new. In 1859, Francois, Jean-Francois Gravelet, or Blanc, called, came here and set up a wire across the gorge close to the falls, and all summer long did everything possible on that wire, backwards, frontwards, crawling. People were stunned that you could even put a wire across in the first place, and it is an amazing engineering feat. And then to actually get on it and walk across on it was even more stunning. That summer, the crowds were enormous, and they idolized Blondin. Out in Ontario farm country, a tight wire walking medical student read about Blondin's exploits. To him, it sounded like a challenge. And so William Hunt came to Niagara and took a stage name of his own, the Great Farini. The Great Farini came in 1860, the year after Blondin walked in 1859, and put his high wire up not too far from where we are right now, right where the, about where the Rainbow Bridge is right now. Blondin had put his wire up there the first year, and then moved it downstream to the Whirlpool in the second year. And in 1860, in about June or July, they actually started competing. Blondin didn't like this very much, because this was Blondin's show. Let's see how we would do this. Now, normally I would have a pole, so this would be a little bit different. So get up on my back. So Blondin decided that he was gonna do something so extraordinary that he would knock Farini off the wire. You have to depend on me to correct this. So here we go, and I've gotta keep my feet. So first he carried a man on his back. Let's see how I... Farini got an even bigger man. But that man on his back carried him across on the wire. Right across. Then Blondin decided to take a stove across Niagara Falls. Walked halfway across and cooked eggs on his stove. So Farini, who turned out to be a very imaginative man, decided he had to do something even more extraordinary. So he went out and got himself a washing machine. Put the washing machine on his back walked out here across Niagara Falls when he was about halfway across. He took a rope, lowered the rope all the way down to the water with a bucket at the end, brought the water back up, and did his laundry. Well, one of the interesting things for somebody who isn't a wire walker, when they ask a question about what would it be like when you go out on a wire, and they say, what would it be like looking down? Well, the first thing is you don't look down. <laughs> you have to look at the rope. You look out in front of yourself about 10 feet, and you fixate on that rope. Back in the 1800s, 11 wire walkers actually walked across the gorge of Niagara. All 11 wire walkers made it safely. The reason is, is they were professionals. Niagara became home to these professionals. For a span of 40 years, they came, the kings and queens of midair. Walking with blindfolds over their eyes, potato sacks and casing their bodies, their feet in peach baskets. It is against the law to put a rope across the gorge these days, and so wire walkers perform close to, but not over, the Niagara River. Niagara Falls has held a long uh, line, a long tradition of, of, of tightrope walkers and wire walkers throughout history. What I am attempting to do is carry on what they started. Wire walkers are drawn to Niagara Falls because Niagara Falls is monumental. Everything about it is big, everything about it is spectacular. Wire walking is a 2,000 year old art. The people who do it are extraordinary athletes. The people who do it in most places in the world are revered as great artists. Whereas when you, when you go over Niagara Falls in, in a barrel, you're taking a great chance. You get in the barrel and nature just kind of takes you over the falls. And whatever happens, happens. Not all of them have used barrels, 
about 16 people have deliberately gone over the Horseshoe Falls here in, in something or other, uh, including two who've done it twice. And out of the 16, 11 have survived. Jeffrey Petkovich and Peter de Bernardi went over together in 1989 to show young people that you could have fun without doing drugs. Yes. And when they took them out of the barrel below the falls, each man came out dressed only in his underwear with a bottle or a can of beer in his hand. George Stothicus, he went over in his barrel with his pet turtle, Sonny Boy. He believed he could talk to the turtle, and he told reporters that if he didn't make it, that the turtle would later tell people why he had done this stunt and why he went over. Now the music starts to descend, you know, like you're going over the falls. It's going down in pitch, like this. And all of a sudden, you hit the bottom of the falls. Ah, it has a huge splash. They took the turtle, which survived, even though George didn't, and they held it at the museum there for years. It never said a thing. The very first person to ride over the falls inside a barrel was Anna Edson Taylor. Her story should have been a cautionary tale. She was 62 years old at the time and uh, was also next to being destitute. She needed money uh, quickly, or she put it, she needed to make some money honestly and quickly. Uh, I guess we could add to that dangerously. <laughs> she did go over the falls on October 24th, 1901 in a barrel and survived, uh, amazingly enough. Patty had hoped to make some money from her exploit of going over the falls in a barrel. Uh, the idea was that she and her barrel, or more exactly a replica of her barrel, would go on tour. And of course, admission fee would be charged for anyone who came out to uh, hear her story. But it didn't work out. Unfortunately, Annie had no stage presence whatsoever. And most people had just, just dismissed her as a crackpot or a crazy person. She was reduced often to selling postcard pictures of herself in her barrel on street corners in Niagara Falls. Eventually, uh, things got so bad that she had to go to a poorhouse. Now we go back to these, the Niagara Falls power cords. There's a ship bell, like the Maid of the Mist. You hear that bell? The Maid of the Mist is, in fact, a small fleet of boats that carries tourists through churning white water to the edge of the falls. It began operating in 1846 and may be the longest playing thrill ride on the continent. No matter where you've worked before, nothing can really prepare you to take in a boat this close to a, to a big waterfall. Although, it is a bit of an optical illusion how close we go. We are have quite a, a margin of safety here. We're a lot further back than it looks, but uh, the people don't know that because the spray is so heavy. So it's, it's quite a show for them. The most people will ask, where's all this water come from? Niagara Falls is one of the biggest waterfalls in the world that operates on a floodplain. Most other waterfalls are runoffs from mountains and tributaries to the rivers, where the Niagara River doesn't have any tributaries. It's just drainage from Lake Erie. The geography is so flat that it's just kind of mind-boggling where this water comes from. This very flatness of the surrounding landscape made it hard for artists to render Niagara. Even the greatest 19th century painters struggled to depict the grand scale and intense energy of the falls. Sometimes the early artists, in order to try to capture the vastness of the scene, would elongate the picture frame and make it more panoramic, make it broader than normal. Um, sometimes, though, to increase the impact, they decided to use a vertical format. They would get close up to the falls underneath it and show the impending torrent coming down upon them. began to come at different times of year, particularly in the winter, to try to get variety in different scenes. The dynamism, this constant 
constant motion. Tremendous movement of the falls is dampened and quieted. There's still water moving, but much of it is frozen. Winter or summer, natural wonders all wore a price tag at Niagara. By the late 1860s, you had to pay for almost every glimpse of the falls. They charged 50 cents in 1850s to Guandagot Island. At Prospect Point, there was an amusement park. You paid to get into the park, and you paid again to get up onto a platform to view the falls. One of the businesses here was Table Rock House. And the scheme here was that visitors were very sweetly invited in to look around inside the building, to take a trip down to the base of the falls and so on, all for free, supposedly. But when you came to leave, ah, uh, then it was a different story. <laughs> you had to pay that stiff fee before you were let out. If you refused to pay it, you were in big trouble. Some people were beaten up and thrown out who couldn't pay or wouldn't pay. On both sides of the Niagara River, fences and factories lined the banks and blocked the view. Citizens in both countries were outraged. For 15 years, their protests swelled as they demanded that both nations tear down the factories, clear land, give the world a chance to see the falls. In 1885, they won. The two countries set aside 520 acres right by the cataracts. The fences came down. At last, the world-famous view was free for all. Down below the falls is where you really hear them. The sound is overwhelming. When you're below the falls and you look up, you feel like an ant. Well, that's the closest you really get to being beside the falls. You know, you go up Cave of the Winds, and you're completely drenched by the power of the falls. And people take off the raincoats, they get soaked, and they just feel that this power, this water, has an unbelievable effect on them, and it's a real spiritual effect on them. Strip. It's a series of wooden decks we build out into the white water over there. Try to get about 15 feet in front of the Bridal Veil Falls, as close as we can possibly build it every year. 1840, they started the tour into a cave behind the Bridal Veil Falls. 1920, that cave collapsed, and since then, it's been only the walkways out to the front. We can't use any power tools out here at all. We just have hammers and saws and do everything by hand, make all our cuts right out here on the wood, do all our measuring right out here on the rocks. This is a long tradition, these building these trips. For over 80 years now, people have been coming down here. There's been a crew coming down here and doing it this exact same way. Hand tools, walking out on the rocks, and building the trip as close as they can possibly build it to the falls. So, yeah, I'm, I'm part of this tradition now. have always wanted to look at Niagara but by the end of the 19th century there were those who wanted to do something else at the Falls use it for power this looked like an infinite amount of power um, and it was hard for pragmatic Americans to let it go by hydroelectric power at Niagara would become a massive business that would actually change the world but it began small 
In 1882, the Niagara Canal Company used a single turbine to light up a grand total of 16 street lamps in Niagara Falls, New York. Townspeople celebrated with a torchlight parade. It was the first hydroelectric power plant in the world, and that's what changed forever Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls was the birth of hydroelectric power. The birth of power is a very good expression of the sense of optimism that existed around the turn of the century at Niagara Falls. Um, there's, a, there's a sense that it's kind of like a genie, like coming out of Aladdin's lamp. You can ask it to do anything, and it can accomplish anything. New York State optimistically built an enormous tunnel to carry a torrent of water from above the falls through electric turbines and back into the gorge below. But the tunnel project would create far more electricity than the towns of Niagara Falls, New York, and Ontario could use. Buffalo could use it, but there was no known way to send electricity even one mile, let alone 20. What could they do with all that power? This question became the root of discord between two of the greatest scientists who ever lived. What we're going to hear next, we're going to have the timpani return. Now we're going to hear this electric theme, electric motive, the power motive, so to speak, of electricity generated by the falls. Now you hear the timpani. Bum, 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 bum. One combatant was America's preeminent inventor, the genius behind the light bulb, the phonograph, the movie camera, and thus the first motion pictures ever taken at Niagara Falls, Thomas Edison. His rival was an unknown and very odd Croatian refugee. Nikola Tesla said that just being near peaches gave him a fever. He said he heard signals from extraterrestrials. He said he had a magic solution to the problem of transmitting Niagara's power. Use another kind of electricity. A new type called alternating current. At the time, this idea seemed just bizarre. Everybody else, Edison, all of the other experts suggested direct current. That's what existed in other places. Tesla saw the flaw in direct current. It heated up cables dangerously. With alternating current, Tesla could step down the voltage when sending it over long distances, then step it up again at its destination. Edison paradoxically claimed that alternating current was more dangerous. To prove his point, he publicly electrocuted dogs and cats. Tesla gave a rival PR demonstration with himself as guinea pig. After carefully grounding himself, he sent large amounts of alternating current through his own body in public. In 1893, the Niagara Falls Power Company, desperate to make their tunnel work, chose Tesla to design the power station. Because so much water raged through the tunnel, Tesla created gigantic dynamos, 29 tons each. He put cables in place to transmit the power to Buffalo. Very few people believe the electricity could travel that far. So few, in fact, that on the night in 1896, when work was completed, the switch was pulled without fanfare or ceremony. To everyone's amazement, Buffalo's streetcars were running on Niagara power the next morning. What happened at Niagara Falls in 1896 was that we had the very first long-distance transmission of electricity in history. Uh, and in a way, that was a, a much more significant fact than being able to generate electricity because that allowed us to electrify the entire continent. Nikola Tesla, of course, had the last laugh with Edison because the electricity could travel 20 miles away to Buffalo. If Edison's plant had been built, that wouldn't have happened here. The electric tower at Buffalo's Pan American Exposition in 1901 signaled not only Tesla's triumph, but also Niagara's emergence as a source of vast power for North America. The Niagara River, carrying the outflow from Lake Superior, Michigan, Huron, and Erie, feeds the falls with a remarkably steady flow. Soon plants on both sides of the falls sent Niagara electricity nearly everywhere in the Northeast. Inevitably be tapped to serve the needs of industry and the welfare of mankind.
largest rock falls in Niagara's modern history and certainly the most costly virtually... In 1956, the rock wall above one power plant weakened and collapsed, destroying a power plant on the U.S. side of the falls. Hundreds of tons of rock loosened by seepage thunder down the 220-foot cliff squarely upon the huge station which supplies a large portion of electrical current to upper New York State. The collapse triggered the need for a new plant and the start of a new battle over Niagara power. This time, the conflict was between the state of New York and the Tuscarora tribe. The state of New York meant Robert Moses, the man who had already covered the state with expressways, bridges, and public housing projects. Moses was arrogant and dictatorial, but he knew how to get things done. Our objective is cheap power. Cheap power for industry, for cooperatives, for ultimate consumers, wherever they may be. When he needed land for the new power plant and reservoir, he found it just downriver from the falls on the Tuscarora Reservation. To the Tuscaroras, it was all too familiar a pattern. They wanted to take almost half of the reservation. Indian nations, as a rule, are always a prime target for land acquisition, nationwide and in Canada. When the Tuscaroras refused to sell their land, Moses said, the Braves are whooping it up. He offered more money. The tribe responded by posting no trespassing signs. We tried to tell them that there was no dollar value to Indian land. But Robert Moses had in his mind that he was going to take this land regardless of treaties or anything else. He brought in the dozers, the surveyors. He had a host of all police force. He had dogs, riot guns, tear gas. And we had a elderly lady take one of her grandchildren and lay down in front of the bulldozer. And she said, go ahead. You can spill my blood on this land because I'm not going to let you in here. Moses took his case to the courts. On March 7, 1960, the U.S. Supreme Court gave the go-ahead. Moses got less than half of what he wanted. But as construction began, this was cold comfort to the Tuscaroras. The federal government went along with Robert Moses in the state of New York, all except Justice Hugo Black, who said, this is the blackest day in American history. When, it, when international treaties can just unabashedly be violated with utter disregard, totally, completely, to a people's treaty. New York State got a much-needed boost to power production. The reservoir and plant are another example of the human ability to manipulate Niagara. People ask, when do you shut off the falls? You know? What do you tell them? Around 10 o'clock. <laughs> the mighty waters of Niagara Falls pour some 9,000 cubic feet of water per second over this 165-foot precipice. Now, for the first time in history, U.S. Army engineers reduce this tremendous flow to a comparative trickle. Teams of engineers and state park workers remove unsightly logs and tree limbs. We've inspected it, cleaned it, even blasted away dangerous outcroppings so that we might stand at its very brink. Engineers are always on guard for signs of erosion, ready to dynamite away sections when cracks appear in the lip, a telltale mark of danger. People come to Niagara Falls because they believe they're seeing something natural, but the falls has been completely manipulated about two-thirds of the water is now going through pipes. It's not going over the falls anymore. So in a sense, when you look at the Niagara Falls, you're not looking at something natural. You're certainly not looking at what people looked at in the 19th century. Now, if they wanted to, they could remove 85% of the water from above the falls if they wanted to. But by treaty with Canada, the United States agreed in 1950 that they would only take out, at most, 75%. The treaty specifies that approximately 45 million gallons per minute must be flowing over the falls by 8 o'clock in the morning during the tourist season. 
they needed to reshape the bed of the Niagara River above the falls. And so they built coffer dams and deepened certain parts of the river above the falls and where the intakes were for the power plants. To assist in this planning, a hydraulic model of the Niagara River was built at the core of Engineers Waterways Experiment Station. This comparison showing the original conditions on the bottom portion of the picture and those of the final plan in the top portion points up the improvements, particularly on the Goat Island Plain. During the fall, winter, and early spring, when you go to the falls, you're only seeing 25% of the water going over the falls that could be going over. I think we've diminished it. How can we say we haven't? When we control that flow, that river's flow, almost like a faucet in the bathtub. You want to increase it? Turn the knob. Decrease it? Turn the knob the other way. We reshaped the bed of the river around the brink of the falls in the 50s. So the water would spread out more evenly. It didn't look so nice with water going more over the center than the sides. Well, that happened a lot in the history of the falls. It wasn't always the way we think it should look. <laughs> How do we think the Grand Canyon should look? Yosemite, should we tamper with them too? You might say that now what we see is a calculated sublime, uh, something that's been measured. Someone has sat in some office somewhere and decided how much water does it take to give us the sense of wonder and power that this place is still supposed to be all about. To some, the grand pageant of nature seemed to cry out for human enhancement. Even in 1860, people were using flares to light up the falls. By 1924, the show was permanent. Two dozen giant carbon arc lamps beamed on the falls every night. We're probably about 10 times stronger now than we were back there in 1924. The wattage on these is uh, 4,000 per bulb, and the candle power approximately uh, 500 million per bulb. Uh, we didn't have color changers back then. You can get about maybe 25, 35,000 people down there on a good summer night and give you a little feeling of power. Ironically, in the 19th century, people used to love to come to see the falls under moonlight. We'd have extra large crowds there. They said it was a wonderful sight. Uh, and today, you can never see the falls under moonlight because there's so many electric lights flooding it constantly. A committee about lighting asked me about this. Says, have any suggestions? I said, yes, have a dark night. Once a month, all the lights out when there's a full moon. The lights were on for good for the falls. Science had reinvented Niagara. It was now a source of great power. Flow on you, mighty Niagara, your rapid surge and swell. Your waters pound and cascade down to where the rainbow dwells. Miss showers above you and the honeymooners love you. But the basic meaning of the falls continued to change. For most 20th century people, Niagara meant romance. Did these people say, oh, honeymooners from Italy? In the 20th century, Niagara Falls started acquiring a more overtly sexual place in popular culture. Um, there are, you know, film references. Think of the line from uh, the Shuffle Off to Buffalo song. To Niagara in a sleeper, there's no honeymoon that's cheaper, and the train goes slow. Ah, we're gonna shovel, shovel off to, off to Buffalo. Someday the stork may pay a visit and leave a little souvenir. Just a little cute, what is it? But we'll discuss that later, dear. People for over 100 years, actually 150 years, have come here on their honeymoons. They're, the thought is there must be some sexual energy that's here. Uh, I don't know. I once heard it said that there really wasn't anything else to do when you came here. Oh, we'll shuffle. 
and we'll shuffle. Shuffle off to Buffalo. <laughs> That's it. Niagara Falls, two words meaning honeymoon, celebrates with a wedding, of course, its 50th anniversary as the blissful city of newlyweds. Hundreds cheer Shirley Newhouse and James McKay, the city's honeymoon couple of the year. But yesteryear isn't forgotten. Here's Mr. and Mrs. W. Clark, honeymooners here 50 years ago. The bride and groom of 54 depart in a sully for an undisclosed location, followed by bride and groom of 1904. And of course, they drive to the falls, timeless in majesty, timeless perhaps as their love. Every year, millions of visitors are left speechless with awe. The marvel in question is, of course, Niagara Falls. Tourists flock from every state in the Union, every Canadian province, and literally every nation on Earth just to see and experience it. Niagara Falls has been an icon for two centuries. For Niagara Falls to have remained iconic, remained as crowded as it is today, it has had to work very hard to constantly reinvent itself. Anything that's superlative or extraordinary like that, people want to be around it, and they want to be drawn to it, but also, and this is very important, they want to exploit it. So Niagara Falls was this wonderful falls here, and almost right from the beginning, people started to use it in various ways. The falls seems to generate a magnetism that pulls people to it, and then forever links them to this extraordinary place, to one another, and to their destinies. Niagara Falls has attracted many daredevils, some defying clouds of mist, tricky winds, and gravity itself, to walk over the yawning gulf carved by the falls. Others, for reasons as diverse as the daredevils themselves, have used some device to challenge the swirling waters of the Niagara River and plunge over the falls. I think part of the lure of Niagara was that it was understood to be a very dangerous place. And there's another whole history of people going over the falls, the history of daredevils, etc. If you separate the word daredevil, it's exactly what it is. A daredevil is somebody who goes out and does a daring thing. Maybe they make it, maybe they don't. They wanted to challenge the power of the falls, you might say. So we had people on tight ropes, we had people going over in barrels, we had people trying various kinds of stunts, jumping into the falls from great heights, and all of these sorts of things. Of course, this also appealed to the carnival atmosphere at Niagara Falls. The general circus atmosphere, these people were like performers, and people came out to watch them. People are always fascinated by the Daredevil story at Niagara Falls because it's people challenging death. There's that mystique about, you know, I can beat it, I can beat it. So people are always interested in stuff like that. For visitors and daredevils alike, the danger of Niagara Falls is part of the show. Part of the reason they come to this place. Niagara Falls forms what is arguably the world's most famous and popular natural wonder. This unforgettable display of nature's raw power has inspired poets, scientists, conservationists, politicians, and countless ordinary citizens. As partners through the rest of our lives. As partners through the rest of our lives. Not to mention generations of young couples who have flocked to the falls to get married and honeymoon.
Falls has also attracted its share of fascinating and colorful characters and activities. For many, the start of the carnival atmosphere at Niagara Falls was 1827, with the last voyage of the sad ark called the Michigan. Niagara Falls became an important tourist site right at the time when the Erie Canal was completed in 1825. People could finally come pouring into Niagara Falls, and they did. The hotel owners wanted people to stay longer. They advertised in the papers, come and see a ship go over the falls loaded with wild creatures. And people came to see this, to see the Michigan go over. As many as 15,000 spectators looked on as the schooner loaded with animals plunged over the falls. The natural spectacle of Niagara Falls, it seemed, was no longer enough. The carnival had begun. Niagara's next great exploit featured a symbol that would become one of the fall's best-known attractions. Anybody that comes to the falls usually taking the Maid of the Mist. It's one of the oldest attractions in North America. You know, it's a thrill of a lifetime. It gives a person a chance to flirt with danger. This is real. You're there. You feel the spray on your face. You know what it feels like. The Maid of the Mist is often called the longest playing thrill ride on the continent. In 1861, a Canadian firm purchased the Maid of the Mist, triggering one of the greatest, if unintended, stunts in Niagara history. Part of the deal was delivering the 72-foot steamer to Lake Ontario, and the only way to get it there was a perilous, seemingly impossible run through the Whirlpool Rapids just below Niagara Falls. Joel Robinson was a fellow that piloted one of the old Maid of the Mists, and he had to take the Maid of the Mist to Lake Ontario. But you see, you can't bring the Maid up the falls, and you can't bring the Maid down the falls. So Joel took this Maid of the Mist through the lower rapids. The trip was three miles through some of the wildest water in the world. Robinson delivered the boat as promised, but the adventure left a lasting impression. He could barely speak for weeks, and shortly after the ordeal, he retired. Though Captain Robinson and his crew were unwilling daredevils, their feat was no less heroic or amazing. Today, the danger is more illusion than reality. For thousands of visitors to Niagara Falls each year, this is about as close to being a daredevil as it gets. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Niagara Falls. Well, we're probably uh, at least 100 yards from the, the corners of the falls at any, any one time. I have quite a, a, a margin of safety here. It is a bit of an optical illusion how close we go. We're a lot further back than it looks, but uh, the people don't know that because the spray is so heavy, so it's, it's quite a show for them. By the early 1800s, visitors to Niagara Falls were looking for more than just the experience of seeing the falls. It all began with a young man who came here from New England and dove into the water from the top of the falls right below, before thousands of people. 22-year-old Sam Patch dove 85 feet into the churning waters. Ten days later, he repeated the stunt from a height of 130 feet. Less than a month later, he recreated his feat at the Genesee River in Rochester. Tragically, Patch drowned. Niagara's next group of daredevils would go even further. Another class of stunters here are the rope, or in some cases, wire walkers. Uh, people who walked across the gorge on a rope. I think the wire walkers are drawn to Niagara Falls because Niagara Falls is monumental. Everything about it is big. Everything about it is spectacular. So it provides an excellent backdrop for high wire walker. And I think the great love of all high wire walkers is Niagara Falls. And what more spectacular view could you have? People say, what does it look like up there? I have a wonderful view from my office. 
Every day I step onto the wire, I go to my office. Jay Cochran is a modern day high wire walker. He carries on a tradition started by some of the greatest entertainers ever to use Niagara Falls as a stage. My fellow Canadians, I salute you. Well, of course, Niagara Falls has held a long uh, line, a long tradition of, of, of tightrope walkers and wire walkers throughout the history. It's about recreating what Niagara Falls was famous for 150 years ago. It's about bringing that second era back. The first era of wire walkers began with a man who would become one of Niagara's most famous performers. Frenchman Jean-Francois Gravelet, better known as the Great Blondin. In 1859, Blondin came here and set up a wire across the gorge close to the falls, and all summer long did everything possible on that wire, backwards, frontwards, crawling, cooking meals, washing clothes, you name it, the man did it that summer, and people were fascinated. And so he started something at Niagara Falls. You have to think about it in terms of nobody ever having done it before. People were stunned that you could even put a wire across in the first place, and it is an amazing engineering feat. And then to actually get on it and walk across on it was even more stunning. He was able to project himself as a kind of a superman. Blandin was not a daredevil, per se. He really wasn't a daredevil. He knew what he was doing out there on the road. He was a performer. He was not just a rope walker, he was a real showman. And an innovator, too. He came up with many different ideas of stunts to do on the rope. He was a real showman and drew tremendous crowds. London's death-defying acts turned him into a superstar at Niagara Falls. But it wouldn't be long before his supremacy on the high wire would be challenged. When Blondin was performing here at Niagara in 1859, watching him was a young man in the audience who said to himself, I can do this. And so he gave himself a fancy European name, Farini, the great Farini. Farini grew up in the area near Port Hope, Ontario, in South Central Ontario. I think from the time he was born, he wanted to do exciting things. The great Farini came in 1860. In about June or July, they actually started competing. People were perhaps, secretly at least, hoping for someone to fall, something dangerous to happen. That was part of the attraction. So all summer long in 1860, crowds were running from one to the other and back and forth and back and forth to see if one would outdo the other. Farini did just about everything Blondin did on the rope that summer of 1860. Now, Blondin didn't like this very much because this was Blondin's show. So Blondin decided that he was going to do something so extraordinary that he would knock Farini off the wire. So first he carried a man on his back across the wire. Farini got an even bigger man. Then Blondin decided to take a stove across Niagara Falls. So Farini had to do something even more extraordinary, so he went out and got himself a washing machine. Put the washing machine on his back, walked out here across Niagara Falls. When he was about halfway across, he took a rope, lowered the rope all the way down to the water with a bucket at the end, brought the water back up, and did his laundry. So throughout that summer, they continued with this competition. So you can imagine what the scene must have been like in those days. It was spectacular. Farini and Blondin parted and never spoke, never became friends. Blondin would have nothing to do with the young man. Some people claim that Farini was just as good as Blondin. Others say no. 
But looking back on history now, the person that is best remembered is Blondin. And the reason for that, of course, is he was the first person to do it. So I think that's why Blondin is judged to be the greater wire walker. And I think he was the greater wire walker. But Farini was a much more extraordinary personality. More than a few wire walkers would follow in the footsteps of Blondin and Farini at Niagara Falls. In 1873, Henry Bellini drew large crowds to his walks on a heavy 1,500-foot-long rope stretched near the American Falls. He combined his wire walk with a leap into the water below on a tethered rope. Not all the Niagara wire walkers were men. In 1876, Italian performer Signorina Maria Spelterini crossed the Niagara Gorge repeatedly on an 800-foot rope, much like the one Blondin had used. Sometimes she made the crossing blindfolded or with peach baskets strapped to her feet. In 1890, Samuel Dixon crossed the most turbulent part of the Whirlpool Rapids on a rope less than an inch thick. He laid down, stood on one foot and hung from the rope. He is considered the last memorable tightrope walker of Niagara Falls. You might think that somebody who walks very high on a high wire, it's all about fear and scaring the audience. Audiences do come and feel that way somewhat when they come to see somebody walk on a high wire. But when it's done, they're very much inspired by it. They see a human being walking in the sky. They see a human being doing something that appears to be impossible. Walking on a high wire is to take the impossible and make it possible. And I think that's very seductive for human beings because we want to see if we can do impossible things. We want to see if we can do things that other people can't do. What I am attempting to do is carry on what they started. Not just to do what they did, because that wouldn't be accomplishing anything, but to carry it on in a bigger, much grander fashion. My goal is to come back one day and walk across the actual falls itself. It has never been done. There was never a position and never uh, facilities to be able to allow that kind of thing back then. But I will do it. The special thing about Niagara Falls is that it has a long line of tradition and history and I'm honored to be part of it. People came to Niagara Falls to perform stunts because they knew this is where people came to see something magnificent. They also came here because Niagara has this impression on people of making you want to challenge it. People, when they see something as grand and magnificent as Niagara, they want to do something there to challenge its mighty power and to make themselves as famous as the falls. There's something about Niagara Falls that just connects it to desire. If you go and stand at the very edge of Niagara Falls, there's something about it that's irresistible. There's something about it that draws you. And high wire walkers, I think, have that to an exponential degree. They're drawn to it. They're drawn to that spectacle of nature. And the desire inside them is connected to it. I think they got drawn from France or parts of Canada, the United States or wherever, to come to the falls to do what they did but then when they got here, I think there was a magic that really kind of overtook them. And everybody who saw it would be inspired and remember it for the rest of their life. Walkers never obliged. In reality, the danger was more apparent than real. A different and far more risky variety of daredevils would come to Niagara Falls in the new century. The idea was simple. Instead of dancing on a wire, these 20th century daredevils would actually take the plunge. When you go over Niagara Falls in a barrel, you're taking a great chance. 
you get in the barrel, and nature just kind of takes you over the falls. And whatever happens, happens. I guess in the minds of local people, a daredevil, when you talk about the falls, is somebody that goes over the falls in some type of contraption. Whether that be a rubber ball, a steel barrel, a ski jet, or a kayak. 16 people have deliberately gone over the Horseshoe Falls in something or other, including two who've done it twice. And out of the 16, 11 have survived. Some of them, of course, are hoping to make a lot of money from the stunt, but hardly any of them made any money of any consequence. The most famous stunts occurred at Horseshoe Falls, where daredevils would cram themselves into a floating device and be swept over the falls. But the first people to challenge Niagara's mighty power did so in the famous Whirlpool Rapids just below the falls. It's the same location where the Phenabulists, the tightrope walkers, walked across the gorge. For years, they walked on the ropes. But then people were getting tired of that. So they did something different. They started riding barrels below the falls, and boats below the falls, and swimming below the falls. Many people have gone through the lower rapids below the falls. It's the fastest flowing stretch of water in North America. It's a class five, six rapids. About 27 people went through the rapids. The challenge of going through the Whirlpool Lower Rapids was even greater in the earlier years because there was more water going through that narrow, narrow stretch of, of river. So when they challenged the Lower Rapids, they really did challenge it. In 1886, English barrel maker Carlisle Graham was the first to navigate the rapids in a barrel. He made five successful trips. Graham's friend, Maud Willard, was next to try the rapids. She made the trip in a wooden barrel accompanied by her pet fox terrier. When the barrel got caught in the rapids, Willard died in the attempt. The terrier survived. The graves of both Willard and Graham are marked at the Oakwood Cemetery in Niagara Falls, New York. Nearby, another small gravestone honors Annie Edson Taylor. It was Taylor who first elevated the daredevils of Niagara Falls to new heights. One of the most interesting uh, characters here at the falls over the years was Annie Edson Taylor, who was the very first to go over the falls in a, uh, a barrel. Uh, she was 62 years old at the time. And she was desperate to make some money so she wouldn't end up poorly in her older age. So she had an oak barrel made, and she decided to go over the Horseshoe Falls, be the first person to ever do it. She ended up doing it on her birthday, October 24th, 1901. to think some woman in her 60s getting into an oak barrel going over the Horseshoe Falls that no one had ever done before, that took a lot of courage or else she was not exactly all there. Annie Taylor had gone over the edge. She later said it felt like all nature was being annihilated. But the event produced neither her death nor the happier ending she had envisioned. She went over to gain the fame and glory, but she died at 83 years of age in Niagara Falls, New York, in a home for the destitute. So certainly she didn't gain anything, and she didn't gain any glory. Annie Taylor was the first, but certainly not the last, to brave the falls in a barrel or other such contraption. She was followed by 15 other people who went over the falls. They went over in things from rubber balls to more wooden barrels to tubes from truck tires, all held together with ropes and wires. And the next person to go over was Bobby Leach. He went over in a steel barrel, July 25th, 1911. Bobby Leach survived his stunt, and he went to New Zealand 
and was walking down the street one day and slipped on an orange peel and he ended up in the hospital with gangrene in his leg and he died from that. So he slipped on an orange peel and died, but survived going over the Horseshoe Falls. The next daredevil at Niagara Falls would be the first not to survive. Englishman Charles Stevens was clear about his reasons for making the plunge. I want the money, he said. Stevens' preparation did not match his ambition for the perilous trip. Charles Stevens went over in a wooden barrel on July 11, 1920. His barrel was not well made, and when it went over, it fell apart and took his body apart. And all they found was one of his arms still attached to a piece of the barrel. Then we have Jean Lucier, who went over in a rubber ball, steel enforced on July 4th, 1928. And he survived. Lucier was the first person to use something other than a wooden barrel or a steel drum. He spent his life savings making the rubber ball and later sold pieces of it to make money. George Stothicus is likely one of the strangest individuals to test his luck against the falls. The 46-year-old made the trip on July 5, 1930 in a massive barrel. He took with him his pet turtle, said to be over 100 years old. Stathicus explained to reporters that should he not survive, the turtle would tell them about the experience. The turtle survived. Stathicus did not. Adopted by the Niagara Falls Museum, the turtle lived on for many years after his plunge over the falls. When you're near the edge of the falls, there is a draw. I see some people holding on to the railings because it's, it, it has that draw, the, the power of water. Most people don't give in to that draw. Most people look at it and take a photograph and go back home and show it to their relatives. The odd person says, I'm going to come back and make a barrel and go over it. That's an oddity. Many of the devices used by daredevils have not survived the passage of time. Several of the unique contraptions are displayed at the Daredevil Gallery at the IMAX Theatre in Niagara Falls, Ontario. The IMAX experience, we like to think of it as a real and authentic experience. It's as close as you can come to the falls without getting wet. You're not only seeing it on the screen, but you're coming out and that very tactile experience, just to be able to touch the barrel that went over the falls or to look inside and see what that person experienced as if we were plummeting over the brink. The foam barrel, you'll see where little bits of it are picked off. It's like going to the pyramids and picking up a stone. People want to take a little bit of history with them. Among the collection of barrels at the Daredevil Gallery are several that belong to the Hill family, perhaps the most famous family in Niagara Falls Daredevil history. They were known as much for their life-saving efforts at Niagara Falls as for their stunts. William Red Hill Sr. saved 28 people from drowning and recovered over 100 bodies from the dangerous waters. He was a powerful swimmer with tremendous knowledge of the river and falls. His son, Red Jr., helped out on many of the rescues and recoveries. Red Hill Sr. made three successful trips through the lower rapids. The first, in 1910. During the last stunt in 1931, his barrel was caught in the vortex. But his son swam out and rescued him. Red Jr. followed in his father's footsteps, starting his daredevil career in 1945 with a trip through the Whirlpool Rapids. It was an event in Niagara Falls. I was very small at the time, but I remember the whole family being there and looking over and watching the barrel go through the rapids and, and just being mesmerized by the whole magic of it. Because the falls was the forbidden. It's like the jungle. It's got that same fear factor. 
Six years later, to honor his father's memory, William Red Hill Jr. decided to attempt an even more dangerous stunt, plunging over Niagara Falls. Red Hill Jr., he went over in truck inner tubes with wires and, and netting surrounding the tubes to hold them together and leather straps. He called his device the thing. He went over August the 5th, 1951. It fell apart and he was killed. Red Hill Jr. was only 38 years old when he died at Niagara Falls. Another of the barrels on display is that of William Fitzgerald, who used the name Nathan Boyer for his stump. His vessel was known as the Plungosphere. Fitzgerald never articulated his reasons for doing such an outrageous stunt. He was what we call the quiet daredevil. He never made any fanfare about it. He went over, paid his fine, and then left. Since then, I've talked with Dr. Fitzgerald a number of times, and he still says, hey, I have my own reasons for doing it, and he's really never discussed it. Like any person, I am excited when I study these people, when I read about them. It is interesting, very interesting what they did. It's something I certainly would not do. <laughs> would I go over in a barrel? Not in your life. <laughs> I'd never say that the daredevils were foolish. I couldn't get in one of those devices or on one of those devices to go over the falls, so I'm not going to take that away from them. I think they're brave. I think they're foolhardy, though, because unless they really have a death wish, you have to wonder why they'd want to go over the falls. I think most of them needed to see a good psychiatrist. A flurry of daredevils took on the falls during the 1980s and 1990s. These latter-day stunters made the trip in crafts unlike the simple oak barrel that Annie Taylor rode into legend in 1901. Most were equipped with elaborate features to heighten the drama and increase their odds of survival. A few have even included hammocks, oxygen tanks, and radios. Carol Socek, the first Canadian to go over Horseshoe Falls, equipped his converted metal drum with a padded bucket seat, lights, and a radio transmitter. Each one was trying to, in some ways, outdo the previous stunters, uh, because people did get bored with certain kinds of stunts. Carol Socek went over in a steel barrel July 2nd, 1984. He survived, and later he went around and toured with a barrel similar to the one he went over in, and ended up at the Houston Astrodome a few years later, and was killed when his barrel hit the side of the tank into which it was dropped. Made it over the falls, died at the Astrodome. There is something inherently solitary about going over Niagara Falls in a barrel, the kind of thing you would do by yourself. That is, until 1989, when two natives of Niagara Falls, Ontario, created a new chapter in Daredevil history. Then we have the first duo to go over, Jeffrey Petkovich and Peter DiBernardi, two Canadians, who went over in a large, large tank, steel tank, with a periscope on it. They had music inside. And uh, they went over September 27, 1989, and survived. For some people, surviving a plunge over the falls was not enough. Canadian Dave Monday was the first person to go over the Horseshoe Falls twice. Once in 1985, and again in 1993. Dave Monday went over in his aluminum barrel with the Canadian flag on it, October the 5th, 1985, and he survived. David Monday came back again on uh, September 26, 1993, this time in a steel ball, a tank, so he became the first person to go over twice. Over the years, others would challenge the falls. One paddled a kayak, and another rode a jet ski. Neither survived.
There's always been daredevils at Niagara Falls from a very early period. They were people who were attempting to defy death. They wanted to challenge the power of the falls. Most of these people were doing it to gain fame and fortune, to challenge the river's power and its fame, and to become equal with the falls, as famous as the falls. Their fame, of course, is fleeting. We talk about them once in a while, but most people have forgotten them. People do it for fame, but they don't become famous for more than two or three interviews, and then after that, they fade into the mist. Niagara Falls is the canvas on which our stories are told because it's a wonderful dramatic river and the falls and known throughout the world. It's big, it's like Everest. It's wonderful and it's spectacular. Daredevils and stunters help to dramatize the human history at Niagara Falls. Blondin and Farini did it by walking across Niagara Gorge on ropes and wires. Annie Edson Taylor and other stunters did it by riding over the falls in barrels and other flimsy contraptions, often with fatal results. It may be that most didn't really know why they took the world's greatest and most dangerous thrill ride, but each helped to build the legend of Niagara Falls. Daredevils are part of the Niagara allure. It's something that's told over and over again. People always want to know the stories about the daredevils. When you come to Niagara, you just can't help but ask, hey, did somebody go over the falls in a barrel? Yeah, they did. from four of them, Superior, Michigan, Huron, and Erie, will eventually travel through this one spot, Niagara Falls. Every minute, 40 million gallons of water plunge down 20 stories into a violet froth, exploding into a plume of mist and a thunderous roar. It is America's first state park, and those around here like to say the world's first tourist destination. But there are many other firsts at Niagara Falls. Thomas Edison first tried to harness energy here, but in 1893, he was beaten to the punch by a Croatian refugee named Nikola Tesla, and hydroelectric energy was born. Today, 400 miles away in New York City, 10% of the electricity still comes from Niagara Falls. As much as it has inspired genius, Niagara has also inspired its share of daredevils. The first, a 62-year-old schoolteacher named Annie Taylor. In 1901, she went down the falls in an oak barrel with only a bicycle pump for oxygen. When fished out alive, she said, I shan't do that again. She didn't, but 15 others have tried. Five did not survive. But there are others who come to Niagara Falls who have already taken the plunge, newlyweds. Niagara is considered the birthplace of the honeymoon destination, or maybe the world's first aphrodisiac. Even the love-obsessed Italians are coming here. These 20 honeymooning couples are from Rome. As the saying goes, maybe it's something in the water. 
300 years ago, when European explorers were first led to Niagara Falls by Native Americans, they were terrified. They thought the deafening roar of the waters was God's powerful voice. Today, there are 7 million visitors to Niagara Falls every year, each one seemingly more excited than the next. There's not many places where you can say, I've actually stood underneath 75,000 gallons of water every second. And when you're down there, you really do forget about all the troubles and all the bad things that are going on in the world. And you just experience that pure beauty of being able to stand underneath the waterfall. And in this overscheduled, anxiety-ridden age, not one of these passengers is looking down at a cell phone. No blackberries aboard here, just bliss. Equally awe-inspiring and terrifying, Niagara Falls is a force of nature made of sound and fury, a symbol of something that still matters. And just maybe for young nine-year-old Sean Bartz from Baltimore, Maryland, at least for now, Niagara is his American Idol. And Derek Presti is a Niagara Falls State Park ambassador. Derek, you have such a passion about Niagara Falls. You grew up here in the area. You've been working in this job for the last six years. What is it about Niagara Falls that just overwhelms you with emotion? And, and you never get tired of this site. No, not at all. I walk around the park every day, and it's just such a beautiful place to be. We see 7 million visitors each year, and every one of them is just so happy to come here to Niagara Falls and experience the power. It's it great. is. It is such a force of nature, exactly. really, right? And, and in fact, a lot of people ask you the question about daredevils, which, right. you know, unfortunately, the falls does have that reputation as well, but people do try to go over the falls. How many have actually survived? How many have attempted? There's been about 10 that have actually survived going over the falls. All of them that have survived have gone over the horse. Not these falls, the Nobody. American falls. You can no. see the rocks behind us. No. I mean, that's an impossible thing. People have tried to go over in jet skis and canoes, but nobody's ever survived the American falls. And of course, it's illegal, we should make a point of Absolutely. saying, not to mention the human cost yes. as well. Now, there's going to be a once in a lifetime event coming up next year. They're talking about damming part of the falls, this part of the American falls. Why? What do they hope to accomplish? Hopefully, if it's done within the next year or so, they're going to build a coffer dam that blocks all of the water and diverts it to the Horseshoe Falls, not only to do geological research on the erosion of the falls, but also repair some of the historical bridges in our park here. What do you expect the effect will be on tourism? Like, Hopefully, it'll be a boost of tourism and people will be excited to come and see such a unique experience. It's only happened once prior in 1969, so hopefully it be great. And, and you do have a little bit of a scientific theory on, or actually an explanation on why there's so much love in the air here, right? The negative <laughs> ions make people happy, and they come here, get married, and smile, so it's great. All right. Derek yes. Presti, you've been a, a tremendous help to us, and you're such a great ambassador. Thank for you very much, Anna. Park. They're lucky to have you. We really appreciate Thank you. your help. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's go back to New York with Matt and Ann. Hey, right, hey, Natalie. Natalie, real quickly, are they a little concerned about what they may find if they dam up the falls? I mean, not to get too morbid here? Yeah, I don't want to get a little too morbid, but Derek, when, uh, when they do dam up the falls and when they do the geological survey, they do expect they usually find a lot of human remains, right? Unfortunately, yes, that is something that they probably will encounter, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. But it should be an interesting period. Yeah, not, not to end the half hour on the downer there, Natalie. Sorry, anyway. and thank Derek for us. It was beautiful, us. though. The pictures yeah. are gorgeous. And next day. Thursday, by the way, we're going to continue our series of America the Beautiful with our ninth choice for the most beautiful place in the country. Coming up in our next half hour, Emma Watson, star of the... ...sight to see, but you don't have to spend a lot of money to enjoy this natural wonder. In fact, I was able to do it all in just $50 for a day. It's 8 a.m. The park is just waking up, even though the falls never sleep. Armed with $50, let's go spend. As I set out to see and eat my way through Niagara on a budget. First stop, breakfast. At the 2 dollars the perfect way to start my day. Locals tell me to see Rose at Gigio's. Are you Rose? Yes, I am. Natalie. Welcome to Gigio's. Thank you. I hear you have a great special. Three eggs. Free bacon and Italian toast. Sounds perfect. Serve me up. So good. 319. 
time to hit the falls, and I just hit my first major expense. Hi. Yes, one passport to the falls, That'll be $28, please. Thank you. Here's your receipt, and this is your ticket booklet. The tickets are right on the back page there. My ticket to see all the attractions. The best way to see the falls is to get right up into them aboard the Maid of the Mist. This is where you get really wet. Lunchtime, and with $19 in my pocket, I'm ready to splurge. Pete's Market House is another Niagara gem. Hi. Hi. Ready to order? I am. Well, what's good? Oh, I'd say when in Niagara, order the beef on Weck. I'll do a beef on Weck then, and it's $5.50, so. $5.50. Perfect. Weck is short for Kimmelweck, a salted roll, and roast beef is a specialty here. Cool. Yeah, that so looks great. great. That's delicious. All right. It's delicious. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you. I'm feeling a little daring after lunch, so we stop at the Daredevil Museum. Like and the price is just right, too. To uh, there's been 15 people that have tried to go over, and 11 have survived. There's still more of the falls to see. I head back for a very wet walk through the Cave of the Winds. Technically, right now, we're standing in Niagara Falls. All that churning water sure made my stomach churn again. I'm ready for dinner. With 12 bucks left to spend, I'm looking for a good deal. And I found one. Pierogies, 75 cents. Now that's what I'm talking about. Mm. That's the mushroom run. I think that's good. Thank you. They were delicious. Great. Thanks. Mission accomplished. Time to kick back and enjoy the view. And Niagara at night is priceless. Now that you've seen the falls, and if maybe you have a little bit more of a bigger budget and more time to spend in the region, there are a lot of great sights to see. Keith Fellows is with the National Geographic Traveler, and he's also a local from the area. Yep. Keith, nice to have you Hi, here. Natalie. It is such a spectacular sight, but really there's so much more in the surrounding areas to see. There really is. Well. I mean, most people come here, but all around here you've got farm fields, fruit orchards. It's really a sort of a piece of Americana. You say it's such an authentic feel here, right? Totally. I mean, you really can get lost. It's sort of a, 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 a fallback to the past. Absolutely. Right, right, yeah, you, a pun intended yes. there. Let's talk about things to do for families, because there's a lot for families to do and see. There really is. Once you've seen the falls, there's Art Park, which is a great place to get arts and crafts for the kids. Um, Tuesday nights, they have free music. It's just five bucks for the parking. You know, Witchy Havens, people like that. So it's a really great place. A lot also, of there's a great theme park, the Darien Lake Park. Darien Lake Park, which has the uh, largest wooden roller coaster in western New York. Cool. Um, there's six, six big, big coasters free water parks, so it's a really great place for the kids as well. And just the sight of the falls is an adrenaline rush in itself, but for the adrenaline junkie out there, there are a lot of great little adventure tours that you can take as well, right? There really are. I mean, the Whirlpool Rapids boat trip, I mean, you can go inside. It's a dome, but it, the best way to do it is to sit outside, sit up front. It's a bumpy and very wet ride. There's also boating on Lake Ontario. Yep. One of the most spectacular sites to be home, like it yeah, you've got a little town called Wilson. It's got one stoplight and three marinas. And if you're a gambler, of course, there's something for everyone here, including the, the Seneca Casino. Seneca Casino, 4,200 slots. Huge, huge place. I spent the night there last night, not gambling. Yeah, no, it is a great hotel. We've been staying there as well. One time when Niagara was considered the honeymoon capital of the region, is there still a lot of romance here? There really is. And let's forget the heart-shaped cups. I mean, you've yeah. got the red coach in. For 250 bucks, you get three-hour limousine. You get the red, the red roses, the champagne, um, the whole shooting match, chocolates. Um, it's a great sort of romantic getaway. Very authentic little place as well. Also, beautiful wineries in the beautiful area. Beautiful wineries. Great wines. Yeah, there's a wine trail here. Ten wineries. Um, and in fact, this weekend they have a thing called uh, Cool Whites. Hot nights, and it's jazz, free jazz, and each Ooh. vineyard has that. So it's All right, wonderful. Cool. Now, what about, uh, you know, I ate my way through the Niagara region, as, as we saw in our piece there. But for the foodie here, there is a lot to sample. There really is. There's a great Italian community here. There's a Como restaurant. has been around for about 70 years. Dominic probably knows everybody in the whole town. We go there for great, great food. And what about for the art lover? There's a lot of culture here as well. 
There is. There's, the, there's a Frank Lloyd Wright designed a prairie house here at the Darwin um, Merritt House, and it's a beautiful, beautiful little place. It's um, quite extraordinary. It's not something you want to take the whole family uh -huh. to. It's a little escape from the kids. And then there's the Albright Knox Gallery, too. Indeed, and that is sort of the contemporary art center here. But right now they have a Francis Bacon exhibit there. They really are trying to put themselves on the map, and I think they're doing a good job. Well, Keith Fellows, welcome back home. It's nice to have you here as well. Thanks Thank for sharing some of the great sights with us this morning. Yeah, should have brought my uh, bathing suit. Yeah, absolutely. We'll be back with more from Niagara Falls, including getting a little soaked just ahead. But first, these messages.